Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm here with Dr. Stephen Shannon. He is Professor of Theoretical Archaeology in the Institute of Archaeology at University College London. Dr. Shannon focuses on cultural evolution and Darwinian archaeology. In July 2006, he was elected Fellow of the British Academy and is also the author of several books, including Genes, Memes and Human History, Darwinian Archaeology and Cultural Evolution, Mapping Our Ancestors, Phylogenetic Approaches in Anthropology and Prehistory, and the most recent one, The First Farmers of Europe, An Evolutionary Perspective. So, Dr. Shannon, thank you a lot for taking the time to be on the show. Uh, pleasure. Okay. Looking forward to it. Okay, great. So, let me first ask you, because I guess that most people will not be familiarized with Darwinian archaeology, perhaps more with archaeology as it was traditionally done or approached. So, could you please tell us first what Darwinian archaeology is about and perhaps some of the main differences in terms of the theoretical foundations and methodological approaches between Darwinian archaeology and uh, traditional archaeology, let's say. Okay, well obviously uh, Darwinian archaeology takes its inspiration uh, from Darwin's ideas and in particular the idea of uh, descent with modification. So, uh, cultural evolution uh, within that framework uh, looks at the process of the generation of novel cultural variation, uh, the transmission processes that lead to that variation being handed on from one person and one generation to the next, uh, and then finally at the various mechanisms which uh, sort that variation so that some variants become more common and others become less common uh, and, uh, and disappear. So the broad framework is this cultural evolutionary uh, framework, but it also recognizes the importance of behavioral plasticity uh, in terms of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, decision making uh, so that uh, it, it tends to assume uh, the so-called phenotypic gambit uh, that people will make uh, decisions uh, with, a, with specific kind of rules of thumb uh, that will tend to increase uh, their fitness. Uh, so in that line of the evolutionary archaeology, there is an interest. Uh, it takes ideas from human behavioral ecology and ideas from uh, optimal foraging theory and also from evolutionary demography. So that's one strand of it, but the other strand is more specifically concerned with changing cultural patterns. Uh, so on the one hand, in terms of its methods, it's interested in setting up and testing models of optimality or constrained optimality uh, in, in human behavior. Uh, and on the other hand, it's concerned with tracing changing patterns of culture and trying to understand the processes which uh, affect those changes. Mm -hmm. So could we say that Darwinian archaeology is interested both in the cognitive mechanisms that we have evolved as humans during our evolutionary history and that perhaps play a role in our in how we develop our culture and perhaps the uh, our ability to have a culture and to have specifically cumulative culture that I think is doesn't occur in other species, let's say, but also on the other end, in how evolutionary processes work at the cultural level, correct? Yeah, I mean, archaeology obviously doesn't have access to past people's minds. So on the whole, we're tending to make assumptions uh, about people's minds and people's cognitive processes. So the human behavioral ecology assumption is this assumption that uh, 
uh, other things being equal, people will tend to make uh, decisions uh, that are relevant to their fitness. Uh, on the other hand, the question of cumulative culture and this cumulative of process by which evolution, evolution acts on humans through culture much more than through genes, uh, then what we have access to is the, as it were, the population outcomes of that process so that we can see, we can identify times, let's say, when particular innovations occur and we can trace the accumulation of cultural complexity over time and to some degree uh, we can postulate the kinds of processes uh, that might have been operating but effectively on the whole we're really making mostly we're making assumptions about those processes and looking at their population level consequences rather than being able to come up with a kind of novel uh, access to the psychological mechanisms. So innovation is really a big aspect and a very important topic in archaeology in general, but also in Darwinian archaeology specifically, right? The, the ways by which people uh, make use of the cultural uh, the, um, cultural tools that they already have, for example, at the level of technology, and how over time they also create new ones and innovate on the ones that they already had before. Right. Yes, so uh, the key thing is this, is this cumulative process. And the cumulative process obviously depends on cultural transmission. So it depends on, as it were, the previous steps in a particular technological process, let's say, on those continuing to be available through time because they're being passed on uh, through the generations so that new people can come along and then have innovations which are based, uh, uh, which are based on those. And I think uh, perhaps to um, go on to another one which is on your sort of later list of, of questions is um, traditional culture historical archaeology which was prevalent in the first part of the 20th century really focused on culture history which was effective which effectively was a, a, an emphasis on cultural transmission and, and it, it assumed that cultural transmission was all important then archaeology changed in the 60s and the 70s to put more of an emphasis on adaptation. And the adaptationists effectively ignored cultural transmission. And it as assumed effectively that a particular kind of environmental challenge would produce an appropriate cultural response uh, without taking into account uh, the processes of uh, transmission. So in a sense, Darwinian archaeology was an attempt to uh, combine those two uh, as effectively uh, Darwin's theory does uh, because it says well adaptation occurs on the basis of variation which has been transmitted over time. Uh, so if you like the, 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 dy the dynamo, the power comes from the cultural transmission and the environment acts in a selective kind of way rather than a creative kind of way. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about cultures, we also tend uh, to, to define uh, different cultures, perhaps just to give a couple of examples, perhaps British culture, Portuguese culture, Japanese culture and others like that. So uh, is it easy to delimitate a particular culture? And I'm asking you this because it seems to me that throughout human history, uh, cultures have been in contact with one another and there's been a lot of cultural transmission when people when different peoples get in contact with one another and other things like that correct okay so yeah that's a key question which has occupied archaeologists for for a, for a very long time i mean i think the starting point has for that to think about that has to be the idea of isolation by distance so overall, things which are closer together and people who are closer together will tend to be more similar in various ways than things and people that are further apart. So that, uh, and that, uh, and that, uh, those patterns of variation effectively are continuous ones. You can detect clines, uh, 
uh, but uh, you can't necessarily uh, define strict uh, strict boundaries. Uh, there may be uh, certain uh, boundaries that might emerge. So, for example, people who speak the same language uh, might tend to interact more with one another than people who speak different languages. So that's potentially a constraint on the isolation by distance uh, process. Um, what's becoming clear for in archaeology now, over just over the last few years, uh, is a different kind of process which archaeologists have, have kind of postulated but never had have had evidence for. And this, and the, I'm talking about the evidence from ancient DNA. So, in many respects, uh, uh, ancient DNA is a very novel tool, but it's really uh, been a, a game changer for archaeologists uh, because, for the first time, you can trace the links between cultural patterns uh, and genetic patterns. And what we're beginning to see uh, is that some of the main cultural patterns really result from expansions of people. So, for example, the expansion of farming across Europe wasn't a process of, of local hunter-gatherers adopting farming. It was a process of expansion of a population which had its origins in the, sort of the Greece and Turkey uh, area and that population then spread out across Europe uh, with relatively, in fact, very little admixture with local hunter-gatherers. Uh, so, in that sense, we can see if and those particular farming populations uh, then had uh, cultures which were very different from the preceding uh, hunter-gatherer ones. But what's interesting is that as the population spread out across Europe, the culture changed. So even though people were still essentially genetically the same, uh, in some cases we can identify uh, boundaries and say, well, this is the boundary of this culture uh, and this is the start of a new culture, which effectively started a, a further new process of uh, colonization of new parts of Europe. So on the one hand, we can identify, we can associate cultural change with genetic change, but then we can also identify the, those points where the cultural and the genetic change don't coincide, and that's obviously interesting too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, what are some of the main sources that you use in archaeology to better understand a culture and cultural processes? I mean, when we think about archaeology, perhaps most people tend to think about uh, studying human artifacts and architecture and perhaps some sort of human remains. So what are perhaps the main sources that you use to study those kinds of processes? Um, well, really, the the main the main thing is the is the material culture. Uh, so things like the the pottery, the house remains, uh, the tool evidence, uh, and, and so on. And changes in those can be traced uh, quantitatively uh, over over time. And so we can pick up periods again when there's relatively little change and other periods when there seems to be uh, much more change. And in some cases, these different things uh, change uh, in step with one another. In other cases, in other cases, not so much. Um, one of these, again, one, something which has developed over the last uh, few years is an appreciation that in any given area, human population size was not constant uh, over time. Uh, so, we've been developing methods to reconstruct uh, changing population patterns in a region. And we've found that uh, in many cases, what, what you find is a pattern of, of boom and bust in population. So, populations rise to a peak uh, and, then, and then decline again. And it seems, that, at least in some cases, uh, that the, the patterns in the material culture really are mapping onto and are a result of uh, those population, those demographic uh, patterns. Mm -hmm.
And when you're studying a particular culture in archaeology, are you also interested in knowing about what I think anthropologists call the folk science of a particular people, that is, the ways by which they approach the world at an epistemological level, the knowledge that they, they develop about the world that surrounds them, and things like that. Um, well, we are, but it's, I mean, again, with archaeological evidence, it's very difficult to get at uh, those things. Uh, but as one example where people in the last few years have been, made some progress is in the study of uh, early metallurgy and how people came to start uh, uh, smelting co uh, copper ores uh, and then making copper artifacts. And what, one of the things which emerges is that the, it is the colour of the stones that seems to have been very uh, important. There seem to be, if you look at the kinds of copper ore that were used by early people, you can see that they had particular patterns of colour variation, in particular uh, patterns of green and black colours. Uh, in the in the ore, and this kind of this sort of thing seems to have been uh, this colour ore seems to have been particularly selected. Uh, so, and similarly, again, uh, in another example, with when you've actually got your metal, uh, then the colour of the metal varies depending on what other impurities there were in the ore, uh, and what you add to the ore in terms of alloying. And again, it's quite clear from that that people were trying to achieve particular colours uh, in their in their smelting processes. So, in that sense, I think we can perhaps get at some idea of their folk science. Uh, but uh, in uh, in a lot of other cases, uh, it's uh, it's more difficult uh, to actually get at that uh, that kind of thing, given the nature of the information that archaeologists have. I understand. And uh, does the approach that you have in archaeology vary according to uh, the society that you're studying and perhaps the historical period? I mean, I would imagine that perhaps there would be less material or less resources to gather from prehistorical sites than you encounter, for example, in early agricultural societies where you already have more accumulated culture and even also in ancient empires and also more recent societies. Right. I think there's a there's a couple there's a couple of things there. So it's certainly true that the recent periods have more have more material culture. Um, this uh, this has meant that the people who study the old Stone Age up to the period up to about twelve thousand years ago have you have to use all sorts of ingenious methods uh, to try and infer patterns essentially from variations in in the production of stone tools and then how variations in those stone tool assemblages might relate, let's say, to the kinds of animal bones of the prey of people that you find on those sites. So that's, uh, that's certainly true. And if you're asking questions to do with things like social differentiation, uh, again, there is a lot more evidence for more complex societies, early empires and early states. Uh, but that's also probably because there was greater social differentiation uh, in those societies. So in a sense, more effort was put into creating the, the material artifacts that, that represented uh, that, that, those social patterns. Um, but there has been a tendency to assume that these kind of Darwinian methods are only relevant to simple societies, uh, uh, hunter-gatherers and so on. Um, but I don't think that's the case. A lot of people have shown, in fact, that you, that you can use ideas from uh, Darwinian theory to make inferences uh, about complex societies as well and about the kinds of factors that would predict uh, increasing degrees of social inequality. And since we're talking mostly about culture and perhaps 
how a particular society gets structured and organized. Uh, I would guess that uh, archaeologists are also interested in at least some aspects of human psychology. Is that correct? Yes, uh, and again, what we have really is we have uh, information about the outcome of human decisions. Uh, and potentially you can use that uh, to test models of cultural transmission, uh, let's say, so that we can, uh, one, one piece of work I was involved in, we, tried to, we had information on changing patterns through time of different kinds of decoration, and we were interested in inferring whether that indicated uh, conformism or not in the use of the pottery decoration by these by people in these in these communities uh, so we we set up uh, a model which assumed uh, no conformity and uh, essentially assumed a, a process of neutral evolution in which uh, in which basically changes there's no change through time uh, but there is inevitably change for chance reasons in, in, in small finite populations. So we set up a model to test for conformism uh, and we found that uh, in, in some phases there seemed to be changes in indicating effectively unbiased transmission and change solely due to chance factors, whereas in other phase trans trans transitions uh, there did seem to be uh, evidence of conformism uh, in the choices that were that were being made, um, so so potentially again you can set up models uh, to test these things, and you can set up models to test what let's say what preferences uh, people had in terms of the animals they hunted. Uh, so again, did people hunt animals in the most current time for the or is there any indication that they were deliberately hunting kind of big and dangerous animals? Uh, for the prestige that they might have gained from doing so. So you can set up those models and get at some of those motivations, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so earlier in the interview you already alluded to this, but let's now talk a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so earlier in the interview you already alluded to this, but let's now talk a little bit more specifically about the origins and spread of agriculture. So, uh, what is the best knowledge that we have nowadays about what might have been the first geographical uh, locations or areas where people really started creating settlements or societies was uh, econom econ food economy sorry was based on agriculture yes yeah, so uh, so different kinds of agriculture uh, started independently uh, in different parts of the world so in china with millet and rice uh, in the Americas with maize and so on, and in other parts of the world with various kinds of tree crops, uh, as in Amazonia, for example. But the earliest uh, so far seems to be in Southwest Asia, uh, based on the cereals of wheat and uh, wheat and barley. And the process developed at the, basically at the end of the last ice age, uh, and the process probably started maybe sort of 15, 14,000 years ago. And you get the first indications of people cultivating crops uh, around, um, let's say, uh, 12, 13,000 uh, years ago. Uh, and the process seems to have been initially uh, one of uh, increased sedentism. So effectively, uh, people uh, started to become more sedentary, they stayed longer in one place, uh, and they increasingly, uh, that was made possible uh, because by the fact that they could rely on plant resources which were not so readily depleted. So there was a period, towards the end of the last ice age, uh, there was growing sedentism and growing reliance on plants and plants give uh, effectively uh, less calorific return per hour uh, 
in, in overall terms, uh, but they're they're more uh, reliable, uh, and you can uh, sort of settle down in in a single place. So the process seems to have been one of, of sedentism in the first instance, uh, relying on wild plants. And then people seem to have started cultivating uh, those plants, uh, presumably again to uh, to resist the kind of depletion kinds of effects. Uh, and then over time, uh, those plants, those crops, those wheat and those wild wheat and barley and other crops, uh, responded to human cultivation and harvesting by acquiring the traits of uh, domestication. So the seeds of these cereals became larger and they changed their method, the, the plants effectively changed their method of uh, reproduction. So wild cereals, when the cereal becomes ripe, uh, the cereal uh, grains basically explode off the stem onto the ground. And that, of course, if you're trying to harvest them, then that's very problematical. Uh, for for humans, because humans want to harvest them on the ear rather than pick up the individual ears off the ground. Uh, so it seems that the that harvesting pressure uh, gradually uh, led to uh, a change in the plant towards increasing proportions of the plants having the the grain stay on the ear, and this was a biological change. So this, this was a mutation which was present in wild populations and it gradually increased uh, in frequency as a result of human harvest pressure. But this took a long time, so it was a process that took perhaps a couple of thousand years uh, for these crops to become fully domesticated and have these domesticated uh, traits. And animal domestication, uh, which was initially sheep and goats, uh, and then a bit later, pigs and cattle. Animal domestication was probably, at least to some extent, uh, a consequence of people tending to settle down in one place to grow plants. So it was no longer so easy to, uh, to follow mobile animals. People were stuck rather in one place, and they then started to manage uh, the animals. Uh, uh, and one of the indications of that uh, again, it took a long time for domestic animals to, dem to acquire the domesticated traits uh, that they gradually acquired under, under domestication. So domesticated cattle and so on tend to have different kinds of horns, the animals tend to become smaller, but this too takes a long time to emerge. Uh, so the, uh, the earliest evidence that people were trying to control animals is evidence uh, from animal dung uh, found on archaeological sites. So you can see the archaeological traces of animal dung on these sites indicating that sheep and goats were being penned up uh, within these uh, early farming settlements. So that kind of evidence emerges uh, before the evidence of the changing forms of the animals themselves. Mm -hmm. So, with the knowledge that we have, could we say that perhaps first people started their farming settlements and domesticated animals uh, came later in history? Yes, not, not much later, but, but definitely, uh, definitely uh, cereal, cereal agriculture uh, comes, comes first. Uh, and it's... Animals in other areas are much less important, actually, but in Southwest Asia, where the animals are important, it's definitely cereal agriculture, uh, which starts uh, before animal domestication. And was it because people felt the need to complement their diets with animal sources and because they were no longer uh, hunting as they did before when they were hunter-gatherers, uh, or perhaps also because they are, were using animals for other ends, like to create clothing and to help them in their agricultural work and other things like that. Yes, yeah, so it, it, was, it was certainly food to start with, uh, but probably uh, at a very early stage. Uh, so, uh, 
as I say, people tended to be stuck in one place more. It was less easy to mount hunting expeditions. And if you go a long way hunting, uh, okay, you can be mobile like that, but it's not so easy to bring large quantities of meat back to your camp, or by the time you've got back to your camp, then you will have eaten all the meat that you've hunted. Uh, so it, it made sense to start keeping animals, but at a very early stage, it's clear that it wasn't just meat that people were interested in. People were interested in milk uh, as well. Uh, so there is quite early evidence uh, that people were uh, exploiting uh, sheep and goats and cattle uh, and cattle for, for milk. Uh, but other things came later. So in terms of clothing, uh, it was quite a lot later before uh, wool uh, was used, and that depended on the evolution of, uh, of new varieties of sheep. So the earliest uh, woven textiles were made out of flax, uh, and flax was, again, one of the early plant uh, domesticates. Uh, animal traction, in terms of uh, pulling, People probably always used animal traction in a relatively casual kind of way uh, to kind of carry loads and this kind of thing, uh, using cattle to carry loads. But it, w it seems to have been a lot later before there was kind of systematic uh, ploughing uh, with, with yoked oxen. And that's uh, the idea of using animals in this kind of way, sometimes referred to as the secondary products revolution, when people started using animals for traction uh, and placed more emphasis on using uh, sheep for their wool uh, and so on. And what would be the most important things for us to know when it comes to the origins and spread of agriculture in Europe? I think the key thing is really to understand that farming uh, made possible uh, a population uh, demographic revolution, essentially. Uh, so it's clear from ethnographic and other studies uh, that a key thing in terms of uh, demography is uh, the women's state of nutrition and also the possibility of providing uh, weaning foods for babies uh, when they come to the end of just relying on their mother's milk. And it's clear that the the beginnings of agriculture provided large quantities of carbohydrate energy to women uh, which weren't previously available. So the, it's pretty clear that women's energy balance shifted in a positive direction and with that effectively women, tend to, women tended to give birth more often and, and associated with the improvements in, in weaning foods those young children tended to survive better. Uh, so it's this combination of improved child survival uh, and improved uh, women's nutritional balance, which enabled populations to increase. And as those populations uh, increased, uh, it became increasingly uh, advantageous uh, to colonize new areas and to be and to be the first colonist in a new area, so long as that area was favorable to farming. So the spread of farming, in a sense, if you like, was a population pull process. So, I mean, just like the uh, expansion of population across, across North America in the 19th century, uh, people were taking advantage of essentially empty land, which was very suitable for farming, and interestingly, those areas which were very good for farming in Europe were by and large not particularly good for hunters and gatherers. Uh, so we know that hunter-gatherer population densities in those areas were low, so it was possible for farmers to expand into them uh, and again to increase their reproductive success. And that's what the ancient DNA evidence tells us. We can see the population uh, increasing and we can see basically that the descendants of the Anatolian farmers who expanded out into Europe, their descendants basically take over the European population. So in evolutionary terms, in natural selection terms, uh, it's a very successful strategy. Uh, so if you uh, 
if you pass if you keep passing on forming practices and knowledge to your children those children also will tend to have uh, more children they again will teach their children about forming practices and how to look after their animals and when to plant the crops so you get this feedback between the cultural transmission of farming practices and knowledge and the growth of the farming population as a result of the natural selection advantage of farming versus foraging. And are there any cultural processes or cultural practices that we know about that might have favoured the adoption of agriculture by certain societies and not by others? Or was it mostly a matter of simply certain people having access to a plant and animal, a plant and animal species that uh, they were able to domesticate and others don't? So, yes, so that, that area of Southwest Asia where it all began is basically you find all the different domesticates uh, in that area the the, the, the wheat and barley uh, other things like lentils and peas which were part of the early domestication complex uh, sheep and goats and cattle and pig are all found there so that was a particular uh, area which was favorable bringing all those things together uh, but it was it was the transmission of all those things them and effectively uh, the, one of the important things about the Southwest Asian farming uh, package if you like was that it was very portable so not only obviously would the animals move themselves but because we're dealing with uh, annual crops which need to be planted and harvested each year so if you're moving out and colonizing new areas uh, you can simply carry your seed corn with you uh, and plant uh, as soon as you arrive. Uh, so having having the, basically having the material is critical. Uh, but it, it seems that it doesn't seem as though foragers, by and large, uh, acquired those materials from farmers in Europe and started farming themselves. Uh, mostly, it seems as though over time, uh, more foragers. Um, became incorporated into farming communities and there was more interaction between them but this took a this took a very long time this took a very long time uh, to to happen uh, but most places where we look farming is introduced uh, by immigrants basically and that was that was true of Greece and Southeast Europe uh, around uh, nine to eight thousand years ago and it was true of Britain and southern Scandinavia uh, several thousand years later. We can trace the immigrants with the ancient DNA. So uh, talking about the spread of agriculture, uh, could we perhaps refer to sort of group selection processes occurring there in terms of perhaps certain groups or societies because they adopted agriculture earlier, they were able to outcompete other societies and groups and also maybe assimilate other peoples? Well, that I mean that that seems to be what that seems to be what happened. Uh, probably not just uh, in in Europe, but probably where farming expanded uh, eastwards uh, as well. Um, it's hard to say whether it was. Uh, I guess it must have been effectively some kind of uh, small scale uh, group selection, but most of these groups would have been very small. And it's really quite hard for us to distinguish uh, between individual and uh, and group uh, and group selection. Uh, but uh, in as much as what what would have been happening would have been again perhaps a useful analogy is the colonization of the American West. You have lots of groups relatively independently, I think, moving and expanding the agricultural uh, frontier, and some of those groups would have been successful and some of them uh, wouldn't and perhaps that's um, that's even that that's perhaps more striking if we think about the Mediterranean colonization because the Mediterranean colonization by and large uh, was by boat 
so it's reasonable to assume that probably quite a lot of the colonizations failed uh, and people drowned and, uh, and, and so on. But clearly some of these communities got through. Uh, and to some extent, we can see uh, uh, a loss of diversity in those West Mediterranean populations. So we can see so-called founder effects. So uh, genetically, uh, the former population was more diverse in Southeast Europe than it was in Iberia when farmers first arrived in Iberia. And that is because essentially the, the process of successive founder effects meant that genetic diversity was lost. And that was also lost in the animal populations as well. So even the, the cattle populations are far less diverse in the Western Mediterranean than they are in Southeast Europe. So we can see these processes uh, going on. And in as much as the colonization must have taken place, not through individuals, but through households and small groups of households, at that, small, at that scale, I think we have to think of a, a kind of group selection type process. Mm -hmm. So earlier in the interview, you referred to the importance of demography in human societies. So uh, can we say that agriculture changed human demography, perhaps increasing the growth rates in terms of the number of individuals that are part of a given society? And did that have any kind of implications when it comes to rates of innovation as well? Or uh, well, I think I mean, it's quite clear that even hunter-gatherers societies can, uh, can bounce back quite quickly or can increase quite quick, quickly if they move into new areas which have previously been uh, unexploited. So the key thing is not so much the rate uh, of increase, but the fact that in very large areas, uh, farming has much has a much higher carrying capacity in the number of people in terms of, in terms of the number of people that can be supported per square kilometre. Uh, so that uh, is say is is much higher in general uh, in in zones that are favourable for agriculture. Uh, then you get much higher populations. And then areas of the world which, uh, which, which were not so favorable for agriculture uh, were by and large not colonized by farmers until much more, until much more recently. So it's clear that, say, that the farming populations in general are denser. And I think it's also pretty clear that farming populations have higher rates of innovation. Uh, overall. So um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure anybody has done the sort of detailed kind of uh, work to uh, to actually measure those uh, those different rates. Uh, but overall, I think uh, the the changes in, ter in human society since the beginning of farming sort of 10,000, 12,000 years ago have been obviously hugely, hugely dramatic. Uh, and f far uh, exceeding the changes that took place in the previous uh, 50,000 years uh, before that. Um, so, so yes, I think it, it's really, it is clear that rates of innovation are, have increased with the increases in population. And isn't it also the case that another aspect that we have to consider when it comes to the advent of agriculture would be that at least in early agricultural societies or settlements, and I'm not sure if we could even talk about what I'm going to talk about now uh, until a very recent historical period, let's say, but that uh, the uh, people's health really deteriorated with the introduction of agriculture in terms of their diet and perhaps the, uh, the fact that they also went through uh, regular periods of uh, famine and things like that, correct? Um, it's, 
overall, as I say, pop population overall went up. But as I as I suggested just earlier, that doesn't mean that populations in any given area were were constant. Uh, so that there was certainly uh, there was certainly evidence of these population rises uh, and crashes uh, in most areas that you look. Uh, but uh, over time. But there, it's clear that there was a, an increasing population trend. So, for example, uh, in the Mediterranean over the period since the end of the last ice age, um, the the climate gradually became drier. But even though the, the, the climate was becoming drier, uh, human population densities clearly uh, increased. So it seems that more complex forms of organization the early states and empires and so on, it seems likely where, where they were able to sustain higher populations, uh, perhaps in spite of uh, increasingly uh, adverse climatic conditions, if you, if you assume that increased dryness would have led to an increased likelihood of drought uh, and so on. Um, and people would also have been uh, become more vulnerable to things like um, these zoonotic diseases if they're living very close to their animals and so on. So um, that all was almost certainly increased vulnerability uh, on that score. Um, but that is not something we know very much about at the moment. But again, as people are now being able to starting to gather uh, ancient D DNA information on ancient pathogens, uh, it will become possible to uh, to look at that in more detail. And it seems uh, it seems in that respect uh, that there is evidence now in in northern Europe from about uh, five thousand years ago. There is evidence of the plague bacterium, for example, being found in human populations. Um, so. Uh, as work goes on, which I'm sure it will do very rapidly in the next few years, we'll start to increasingly understand the relationship between changing human population densities and sizes and uh, changing incidence of pathogens. Mm -hmm. uh, those zoonotic diseases that you're talking about, were they the same ones that Europeans carried to the Americas when they arrived there and that were responsible for the deaths of millions of uh, native populations there, or native I, people there? Yes, I mean, I, to be honest, I don't know. If, uh, diseases like measles, uh, I don't know if they're of a zoonotic origin or not, but certainly uh, things like TB uh, probably, probably were. Uh, so, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I, I just simply don't know enough about that to, to be able to say. Okay, so let me just ask you a final question, because when we talk about archaeology and anthropology, people tend to make this distinction between the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. So when people talk about the Neolithic, what are the sorts of uh, things that they are referring to that, that, perhaps, that perhaps arrived uh, in human populations and human history when we move to the Neolithic? Okay, so in, in most places uh, the Neolithic uh, basically means the introduction of farming uh, essentially. Uh, so that, that is the key even though the, the term arises, uh, the term came, uh, emerged in the 19th century. And so Paleolithic was the old Stone Age, Neolithic is the new Stone Age. And the particular feature that characterized the Neolithic was supposed to be the appearance of polished stone artifacts. Uh, so polished uh, stone axes uh, and so on. Um, and indeed, the appearance of those axes does overall tends to go hand in hand with the appearance of farming because farmers uh, were engaging in much more um, cutting down trees for which you needed those axes so that it's part of the, the farming package uh, in many in many respects. Uh, 
in other places, just in some parts of the world, they're just to confuse things. Uh, Neolithic is sometimes used to simply refer to the first appearance of pottery. And it's uh, the first pottery uh, appears uh, in, in China, probably about, I think, 18,000, 20,000 years ago. And then pottery actually spreads westwards across Siberia over the following thousands of years. And in some cases, uh, archaeologists who work in those areas start referring to Neolithic uh, when you get the appearance of pottery. And even though people are still engaged in hunting and, and gathering. Um, but um, I think that the main thing to hold on to really, I think, is that Neolithic goes with the uh, goes with agriculture and the fir and the first farming. So that, I think that is. You can argue about that around the edges, but that's the, that's the key key feature, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, just what is the time frame that we're talking about here when we refer to the Neolithic? Okay, so uh, roughly from let's say. 12, uh, it varies again because it, it's associated with the introduction of farming. So it varies depending on when farming was introduced. So to give an example, uh, in Southwest Asia, uh, we would say that the beginning of farming is probably around 12,000 years ago. And then it continues to the beginning of the local uh, Bronze Age which is perhaps um, 6,000 years ago. Uh, whereas if you uh, look at Britain, say the beginning, the Neolithic there, the beginning of farming there is around, starts at 6,000 years ago. And the beginning of the Bronze Age is around uh, 4,000 years ago. Uh, so that kind of, uh, that makes it slightly confusing as well. Uh, because, as I say, farming arrived in different places uh, at different times. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Dr. Shannon, just before we go, would you like to tell people what are some of the best online places if they want to get in touch with your work? Um, I think people can always uh, get in touch with, with me through my UCL uh, email address. Uh, there are kind of, if they search for me on Google Scholar or on Academia, they'll find lots of references uh, to to publications. So, uh, so those are those are probably uh, the the best uh, the best places. Yeah, ResearchGate as well. Likewise, you'll, you'll find a lot of publications and a lot of uh, citations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will be leaving links to all of that in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Shannon, again, thank you a lot for taking the time to be here with us on the show today. And it was really a pleasure to everyone. So, No, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Hi everybody, thank you so much for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics from a variety of fields. So just to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you don't like Patreon, you can also do it via PayPal and Subscribestar. Yeah, all of the links will be in the description box otherwise and if you like what I'm doing please share it leave a like and hit the subscription button I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelina, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Jane Eninen, and my first producer, Isar Weber. Thank you for all.